Hi, everyone. My name is Doran Weber. I'm the Vice President and Program Director at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. We are a nonprofit philanthropy founded in 1934, and we make grants for research and education in science, technology, and economics, for the quality and diversity of institutions, and for public understanding of science and technology. Our program in public understanding of science and technology is geared at bridging the gap between the two cultures of science and the humanities by commissioning, developing, and producing an array of culture-defining products, books, radio, films, theater, television, and new media. We have a nationwide film program that has been running for several decades. It consists of a dozen film schools and six other screenplay development partners besides Athena, and has resulted in over 30 feature films. We have a long-term commitment to telling stories about women in science, such as the play Photograph 51 about Rosalind Franklin, the documentary Bombshell about Hedy Lamarr, and the book Hidden Figures, which became a very popular Oscar-nominated film, and I think a, a culturally defining uh, moment. Uh, at this year's Athena Festival, we will be showing uh, three films that we were involved with, two picture scientists and coded bias that we helped to develop, one about sexual harassment of women in science and the other about the algorithm bias encoded in computer systems, and a film called Ammonite about the uh, 19th century paleontologist Mary Anning, played by Kate Winslet. The Sloan Foundation is so proud to partner with the Athena Film Festival to bolster the pipeline of women filmmakers working on women in science-themed projects and to draw attention to these stories through grants, writers' lab fellowships, screenings and panel discussions, this partnership illustrates the importance of women working in STEM and women filmmakers working on STEM projects. At the virtual festival this year, through the Making It Happen Women in STEM program area, you will see films that showcase extraordinary women working in STEM fields. The Sloan Foundation is proud to sponsor these events. I hope you enjoy and as, are as inspired as I am by these stories. Thank you. Hello, my name is Farida Badamosi. I am a black American woman. I have brown skin. I'm wearing a head wrap, which is multicolored with reds and blues. Um, I am wearing earrings, a bride of Frankenstein. Um, I'm wearing a blue shirt with pink flamingos on it. In my background is beige and black with colored post-its. Um, and I am the programmer at the Athena Film Festival. And on behalf of Barnard College and Women in Hollywood, it is my honor to welcome you to the 11th annual Athena Film Festival. This festival is dedicated to celebrating the stories of bold, courageous women leaders and the filmmakers who bring these stories to life. Thank you for joining us. This year's festival would not be possible without the support of our dedicated sponsors. Please join me in thanking Athena's founding sponsor, the Artemis Rousing Foundation and its CEO and founder, Regina K. Scully, whose visionary leadership makes our work possible. A special thank you as well to our premier level sponsor, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which shares our commitment to showcasing stories of women in science. To all of our sponsors whose names you will see before each film and event, thank you for your commitment to challenging our culture to be more inclusive and inspiring audiences in the process. This year, we wanted to create something new and exciting to bring to our audience. So we are, have created these eight different program areas that we believe react and respond to our current moment. This conversation is part of our Make it Making It Happen Women in STEM program area. In this program area, we tell the stories of fierce, fearless women working in STEM. Uh, we'll see the discoveries they make and the challenges they face as they uncover the truth about our world and break down social barriers. Um, this panel, which is titled Understanding Numeracy, Breaking Down Numbers to Break Up Oppression, is an important part of Make It Happen Women in STEM. Um, and is sponsored by Al Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. I'm very pleased to welcome Amanda, who will be moderating this conversation and will introduce our panelists. Hello, and welcome to the panel today. We're excited to have you joining us. My name is Amanda McCulloch. I am the Executive Director for the Data Visualization Society. I am a white woman uh, standing here in front of you with a multicolored uh, blue leopard print coat on over a dark blue shirt. I've got a nice deep navy blue background with some white, some plants, and some artwork behind me. And I'm very excited to be welcoming an amazing panel who are going to be speaking to us about their experiences and engaging in conversation on this topic around numeracy and the role that data plays in our society today. 
as we talk about things like data literacy and how we engage with data and information, it's hard to escape the amount of data that's thrown at us every single day across news media and other spaces, and the ways in which data is informing our day-to-day -day lives in ways that it hasn't in the past, especially in the light of all the events of 2020 and extending into 2021. So I'm excited to go ahead and welcome our panel and hear a bit more about their expertise. I'd first like to pass the mic over to Tamara K. Knopper. She's a sociologist who will share a bit about her background and experience. Tamara, to you. Hi, my name is Tamara. Thank you so much, Amanda and Frida, and for everyone who is part of the organizing of this event. I am a sociologist by training and also a sociology professor. I teach research methods, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. I'm also a data artist, and I do a lot of writing with data. So um, uh, some of my research and policy work has looked at alternative data and credit scoring. I recently created a series of data stories for Colin Kaepernick's Abolition for the People series. Um, uh, I am an East Asian American woman with long black hair, cheekbones up to here, which I love by the way, um, uh, black eyes, you know, black hair. Um, I'm wearing a burgundy shirt. Behind me is a stack of books. In fact, it's a stack of books of a book that I edited that just got published yesterday. So um, we do this till we free us. Um, uh, Abolitionist organizing and transforming justice, which is a collection of Miriam Kaba's writings and interviews. So. Thank you so much, Tamara. Um, next, I wanna introduce our next speaker, Megan Townsend. She works with GLAAD as the Director of Entertainment Research and Analysis. Megan, to you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, like Amanda said, my name is Megan Townsend. I work at GLAAD, which is the world's uh, largest LGBTQ media advocacy organization. Uh, and I've been here for nine years now. So it's definitely been uh, a world of change kind of in that time. And uh, a huge part of that has been finding and uh, creating and designing what GLAAD's research and uh, and data story is and how we communicate about our uh, about our community in entertainment to uh, stakeholders who are making decisions, but also to LGBTQ audiences. Uh, I am a white woman. I am bisexual. I am wearing a this tan and ivory houndstooth sweater. Uh, and I have uh, brown hair, red glasses, and in my background because I am very on brand as a queer person. I have a rainbow macrame piece uh, and some plant uh, wall art on a white wall. Fantastic, thank you so much, Megan. Next, over to Lindsay Pichnik. She's the Assistant Professor of Mathematics at Barnard, and she'll be joining us to speak about her work and her research today. Lindsay, to you. Lindsay, you're on mute. Can you share your, can you share your sound with us? Congratulations. Well, we know I can move my mouth. Um, so as you said, um, I am a math professor at Barnard currently. And um, I'm, my relationship with numeracy is slightly different as definitionally I'm supposed to help people master it on some level or that's what people think my job is. Um, and I think one of my most direct relationships with it has actually been a course that I've taught for about, oh, almost 15 years now, every summer, which is called Basic Mathematics. And it covers everything from how to add to graphing basic shapes and factoring arbitrary degree polynomials in six weeks in a summer for people who are returning to school after having been away for a long time. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that this feels particularly relevant to our discussion is that there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of, I've been living in the real world, but what does the math in the classroom have to do with the math in the real world discussion? And so that's um, really interesting. And I also think as someone who does their own research in mathematics, the way that mathematicians talk about math with each other versus the way human beings talk about math in the world mm -hmm. um, are very different. And that's an interesting conversation to have as well. Mm -hmm. um, I am a pale white woman um, with long, straight brown hair wearing a 
pinstriped pink shirt, though it probably just appears pink on camera, and with a fairly large train that appears to be coming in over my right shoulder, which was actually uh, built to scale by my great grandfather. And the rest of the people in my family are in humanities, but this train is proof that somewhere in the genetic code, there was someone who could do some math. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, and last but not least, over to Chantilly Juggernaut. She's the founder and CEO of Millennials and Data, and I'm excited to welcome her to the stage. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Hello, everyone. I am Chantilly Jagannar. I'm the founder and CEO of Millennials and Data, a nonprofit organization uh, that works to bridge the data literacy and analytical skills gaps by training and mentoring students uh, who are currently uh, in the university. So uh, freshmen, sophomores, uh, juniors, and seniors who are in uh, secondary or, or undergraduate school. Um, I'm also the vice president of data visualization uh, for Lovelytics, a consulting company based out of Washington, D.C. I'm also a Tableau Zen master, a Tableau public ambassador. Um, my, my background is data visualization and data analytics and really uh, helping businesses and, and students and, and whatnot understand how they can use um, education to, you know, answer business questions and uh, take their business to the next to the next level. I'm a fair toned uh, American woman. I have a purple hoodie on, uh, long curly brown hair, four gold chains, and I have a whiteboard in my background. Thank you so much. And to bring it back full circle in terms of context and backgrounds, um, I'm Amanda McCulloch again. I have a master's in public health and have worked in, with public health data for the past nearly 11 years. Um, I do volunteer with the Data Visualization Society, but also work full time developing dashboards, tool, charts, graphs, and other data visualizations, uh, and writing and speaking about responsible data visualization. So it's delightful to be with this group of women here today, in part because many of your topic areas actually touch on some of my own background. I have an undergrad degree in sociology. <laughs> uh, I also use Tableau quite frequently. I liked math enough to get through some uh, some college some college calculus, Lindsay, but then I decided that that was done and I switched over to the graphing part of things. And I've done a lot of work using data for advocacy in the healthcare space. So I'm very excited to have you all here today and joining us. Uh, we wanted to kick off uh, this panel just with a, a broad conversation and question about kind of where we are today in terms of what is the public's current relationship with numeracy and data literacy, especially as we come out of a year where data and charts and graphs were really kind of front and center of a lot of the, the media we were consuming, but is that really reflected in what our current relationship looks like across our society in terms of how we think about, look at, and use data in different ways? And I'll open it to the floor to anyone who wants to jump in and go ahead and, and share their thoughts. Well, I'm gonna say I am always concerned when the public en masse has to consume data um, because very often in our society, out in news, but primarily outside of news, data is used to manipulate people intentionally, to get people to think about things in a certain way. So when you're trying to um, intentionally inform people in a proactive, helpful way, I'm always concerned whether people understand what's being presented to them, whether they know what the right questions are to ask, or whether they've been so jaded by being manipulated by different entities through their life that they're just turned off to seeing any sort of numerical content, particularly on the massive scales which we've seen this year. It makes me think of that comment you made about people walking into your summer class feeling fearful in terms of what their relationship was with, with kind of walking into and learning some of these baseline principles that even folks who are stepping into those roles are still feeling that kind of sense of overwhelm. Yes, and also when we talk about data, I think we oftentimes generally sort of mean implied big data on some level, because if we look at a COVID analogy, we know what it means to say, my grandfather died. We know what it means to say that, but what on earth does it mean to say 500,000 people died? Like how many of us can conceptualize that in a meaningful way? That's a much harder thing to understand and communicate. Absolutely. Tamara, Megan, do you want to jump in here? So I'll go ahead. Is that okay with you, Megan? Is yeah, you sure. Go ahead first. So, you know, one of the things is, um, uh, 
I've been thinking a lot about uh, just the kind of conversation about COVID and just all the kind of information that we're getting. And, um, and I remember when um, last year, when there was all this kind of conversation about COVID and being an Asian American, you know, these concerns about how COVID was being associated with being a Chinese flu. And you still see this, right? The quote unquote racist kind of Kung flu discourse and so forth. And I remember, you know, I was on Twitter. So I want to do some kind of um, criticism, self-criticism here. Um, you know, I have a PhD in sociology. I teach research methods, but I, you know, I tweeted, I, I, I did something where I looked up the data on the CDC about colds and I tweeted something very quickly about like, oh, the cold data, you know, like this number of people have died from colds in the US and this number of people, you know, or the flu, excuse me, the flu. And when I look back, I, I was an example of somebody who even as somebody who's trained in kind of data work, I was contributing confusion to the conversation. And so along with what Lindsay is saying about how people are often manipulated by data, one of the things I've become very interested in and that I also teach a lot about in my classes is about like how we participate in these conversations about social inequality, how we participate as kind of informed people, how we try to kind of you know, um, hold elected officials accountable, all these different ways that we're trying to kind of actually challenge power um, or challenge discrimination or inequality, but that I'm always interested in this question about are we adding to the confusion or not? And I use myself as an example to my students and I talk about, you know, how I let my kind of, a couple things get in the way. I, I let my concern about racism and the way that I was watching um, the kind of conversation about Asian people being responsible for COVID, right? But also I used my own hubris. It was kind of like, I knew where to go for the data. I knew to go to the CDC. I knew how to look smart and kind of put in some data points, right? And I look back and I'm like, you know what? I know how to do that, but I'm not a public health expert, right? I am not somebody, you know, we were all, we're all, we were all watching the situation unfold. And there are public health experts who are, you know, infectious disease experts, and even public health experts have different political ideologies. But I chimed in, I went in out of my lane, right? And I can make it look smart. And that's what's kind of sad is that I remember my tweet getting retweeted and it looked deep and everything. But then I thought about it, and I was like, I'm just adding to the confusion. And I'm adding to the confusion in a moment where people are really trying to understand what's happening and understand it as it's unfolding. And now we're increasingly, you know, becoming very personally connected to this data and what we're kind of reporting, right? Um, and so it made me think a lot about, you know, Toni Morrison talks about the difference between data and wisdom and how a lot of times we allow data and wisdom to be conflated. And what I tell my students and I, you know, I say, you know, I had the data, I had CDC data, it's legitimate data, right? It's more reputable than, you know, somebody who's just posting something on Facebook about, you know, just out of their own whatever. Um, but I didn't use the wisdom with it, right? And I think that's what I've become very interested in with data literacy is, you know, are we encouraging also that aspect of kind of wisdom for what we do with data um, when we decide to kind of contribute to a conversation about it? Are we adding to the confusion or are we helping kind of clarify things? I think um, as someone who teaches math and a, a certain side of that, mm -hmm. um, one thing I really identify with about what you said is you use the word wisdom. I often think about critical thinking, mm -hmm. right? Like the numbers can be accurate, but is the way that we're interpreting them meaningful? And what is the goal? Why are we looking up the numbers we're looking up? Um, and what are we trying to use them for? And you have the self-awareness and the um, sort of expertise to say, okay, I know how to go get this data, but was I using it in an appropriate way for my goals? And you suddenly realize like, oh, actually I was yeah, no. doing it in a moment where my goals weren't necessarily aligned with mm -hmm. what maybe I would want the target to be mm -hmm. for an audience. And mm -hmm. I think that that takes a, a lot more self-awareness and sort of uh, literacy in terms of the meaning of what you're doing and how it might be interpreted than most people have. 
Well, and you certainly mm -hmm. aren't the only one in terms of the number of different charts and graphs that made misleading comparisons. I mean, there's examples from Information is Beautiful, which is seen as kind of one of the go-tos for well-designed data visualizations that made some quite misleading comparisons about the pace of mm -hmm. daily deaths when we were barely doing enough testing to catch any. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that you're definitely not the only one who's fallen into that space or that trap. And it, it is, I think it's, it is great to be self-reflective in that way. Megan, uh, did you want to chime in on this bigger question around kind of data society and what we feel like our relationship is with numeracy and literacy these days? Yeah, for sure. I think what uh, what I was thinking about when uh, when Lindsay you said about uh, kind of manipulation and and do people know the questions that they need to ask? Uh, I think one kind of great thing that also kind of personally frustrated me, but it was a good idea for them to do it was last year when uh, when for kind of the period around the election when Twitter uh, changed their functionality to uh, force you to have another step to go through before you could uh, retweet something in an effort to try and kind of slow down or stop the spread of mm -hmm. some misinformation or or people who were, uh, you know, pulling things out of context. I don't remember the exact poll, but I remember there was one um, uh, kind of really early last year in, uh, around the primaries that was, I think it was about black voters. Uh, and they, you know, the headline that ran was some huge percentage. And then if you actually, you know, got five paragraphs down into the article, it was like, oh, but the sample size was 20 people. So it's just like, okay, well then your percent is, doesn't really mean much when you're looking at 20 people that, you know, you have 80% said whatever. Uh, so I think that that is, that kind of effort and, and where people were then able to kind of, uh, you know, raise some of those points on social media where, you know, the initial sort of story hit and people were reacting to it. And then uh, kind of the, the next wave was people coming in and saying like, well, oh, if you, if you look at it, this doesn't actually, you know, mean what you think that it meant. Mm -hmm. um, and I think too, in terms of, of visualizing, especially with everything, around COVID right now, and I know with our own work, what I always kind of strive to do is figure out what is the story, how is this personal, how can I make you understand this in a way that um, that ties back to your own life and your own experiences and means something more to you than just you know a number that you're gonna forget 20 minutes after you see me present on it. Um, and I think one thing that actually, uh, I think it was just this week, the Daily Beast uh, put out a whole series that they they plan to keep doing of uh of graphics that are putting context around what does that 500,000 people look like in comparing it to city populations um so each graphic has you know st louis has this many people this was the date that uh that the u.s you know passed that population imagine these 37 cities uh i think that they did just all being wiped out and that is what 500,000 people looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those kinds of things, like that was like incredibly powerful to me when I saw that uh, graphic and to be able to put it into, you know, a, a frame that is a little bit more personal beyond just, okay, 500,000 is, is a huge number and that's very scary and uh, and obviously uh, devastating and, and very sad, but putting it into that bigger context, I think was so, um, kind of powerful to, to see. I absolutely is, agree, Megan. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Linda. I was going to defer over to you, Chantilly. Floor is yeah, yeah. So I, I totally agree with everything that you just said, Megan. Um, I definitely think that last year uh, brought more awareness to how powerful, you know, data is, but it didn't necessarily bring awareness to the individuals who were consuming that information. So we would just see these graphics and these visualizations on the news and the media and, you know, America was just consuming that, right? They, they really didn't understand the, the impact of it. They couldn't really relate to it unless they had somebody that was close to them who had suffered from them, who had suffered from COVID. And then they could understand that, you know, 500,000, you know, my, my person was one of those individual data points, right? So I think last year brought awareness to it. Um, but I think we still have a, a long way to go, right? Something else that I noticed was that around the reopening stage, when data was very important in terms of how we can get to the next level of reopening, you know, restaurants, bars, especially during the summertime, you also saw that that data bias come into play, right? I don't know if you all remember in, in Florida where the data scientist was, was let go because uh, she did not want to uh, 
she didn't want to portray the data or the information the way that they were asking her to. She was she was uh, she was ethically trying to portray the information in the correct way, but instead uh, she was pushed to try to portray it a different way so that reopening could, could take place. And reopening was based off of what was based off of data, right? So I think last year brought awareness to the public, but I definitely think in terms of literacy, visualization literacy, um, we have a, a long way to go. Yeah. Tamara, did you have uh, something to add in, in there? No, I'm oh, sorry. I saw you. I also you. thought it was really interesting when you're talking about the reopening situation, how <clears throat> what we considered the appropriate data marks seemed to change at times, <laughs> depending upon what our goals were at the moment. Um, and so I live in New York State, Barnard's located in New York. And um, I remember Buffalo was pretty much put into a lockdown again in the fall. And then the rest of the state started creeping up to the levels that Buffalo had been at, but none of the rest of us had to go into that same thing. And what actually ended up happening is that Buffalo had like two months of lockdown that the rest of the state didn't have, despite mm -hmm. the fact that the rest of the state's numbers reached that point because suddenly mm -hmm. people decided, oh wait, yeah, we can't actually go back and do that again. So we have to change the rubric we're using to evaluate when we need to make mm -hmm. these decisions. And I think that makes it really confusing for people too, because that was all in the same state. We were all following the same regulations with the same governor and trying to figure it out and confused out of our gourds. Forget the fact that if you're watching the national news or reading a national publication, each individual state has different standards for how they're collecting the data, how they're presenting the data, what, they're using to interpret the data. And so in many ways, COVID has sort of demonstrated all the different ways that in theory, the same data, because it's the same experience that's going on, can be treated so differently and used so differently. Yeah, you know, um, I just want to say, I'm thinking about this too, you know, I um, teach at a college where we have a very active union and I'm the department rep for the union. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has been happening for um, a lot of college professors is, you know, uh, how is this data being used for if we're going to be back in the classroom or not and so forth. Right. And how are they going to demonstrate that there's a low risk? But it's also, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about, you know, assessment just because part of higher ed is so, assessment oriented and it's really you know part of work life right so i'm always talking to my classes about you know how when you go to the apple store for those who go to the apple store and then you get the email saying how is was so and so helpful today and rate them right and we're constantly rating each other as workers or as customer service or whatever and one of the things that happened is you know these kind of new assessment instruments and you know and this way that they wanted to assess you know, how well my college wanted to assess, you know, um, our classes regarding our use of technology and doing the online stuff. And our union was like, okay, how is this not introducing a new kind of evaluation tool that has HR implications and job implications, right, <laughs> in terms of our job? And they would be like, no, we're not assessing the faculty. We're assessing the class or just kind of the change. And, and part of it is, I remember saying in the union meeting, you know, students tend to judge classes by the teacher. They don't always have a sense of kind of, they, they judge a lot of times their college experience by the teacher, right? Because they don't always kind of look at the college holistically or think they really kind of see the teacher as kind of one in the same for everything. And so, you know, this was something where I've also been interested in kind of the new forms of assessment that people are being put under and data that's being collected, right? Whether it's um, through COVID uh, related kind of measures, whether it's, you know, are you being productive at home? The way students, you know, virtually are being kind of monitored and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. And then the way that like, they're kind of saying, well, we're gonna now evaluate this new process of like the use of technology, but not you, right? But it's like, you know, what I always say is like, when data is being collected on you, like, it's going to be used somehow. Like we, know, we need to know how it's going to be used, right? So like actually, that's interesting to me because right. I did several observations in the mm -hmm. fall, 
and I looked at the new observation form and some of the things listed on it were, uh, so the classes were being taught over Zoom and some of the things listed on it were like, do they use the hand raise function? Do they use this function? Did they use that function? Well, one thing is that um, what Megan was talking about, I'm looking at one data point. I'm observing one class. So whether they use breakout rooms in that class, does that mean they always use it or never use it? And also, does it matter if you use the hand raise function if day one you said, hey, throw your comments in the chat because sometimes I miss the raised hand with 100 people, <laughs> right? Like, um, the, what is the meaning for the data I'm collecting mm -hmm. on that person if there's zero context for it? Mm -hmm. And well, it's all brand new. Like, it wasn't what we were sort of created to do. Right. Well, and I think you're both hitting on points and, and in our kind of the other remarks from Megan and from Chantilly around all the different ways in which data is collected consistently or inconsistently, even down to how routine health statistics get reported that people may assume are somewhat consistent and are not in terms of the timeliness, completeness, accuracy of that data. And then you're getting into all these other nuances around what metrics are we looking at against what benchmarks. And if all of us have a relatively high amount of data acumen and, and capability based on the work that we do on a daily basis, working with data, data and information, what do you actually see are some of the big barriers to understanding this information when it comes to numeracy and the broader public? I mean, how do you kind of move from a place of you can think critically and, and probe and ask questions about the methods, Tamara, about how these surveys are being used or you can probe in and you can kind of think critically about the ways in which a visualization is making you feel like you talked about Megan with the Daily Beast examples and the maps. But what's how do we get from kind of where we are over to instilling and supporting um, a broader community and addressing some of those barriers? I know Chantilly or Megan, if you have some thoughts to weigh in on that around the barriers and challenges that people face. I definitely think that um, the the main barrier that I see. So I teach I teach students who have no idea like what data is. Right, literally on day one we talk about how you can collect data, where where data comes from, things like that. And the thing that I found with you know breaking that barrier to helping somebody new to data understand it is making it relatable. How can you relate it to them? Uh, two years ago, before COVID happened and we were all on lockdown, I held a, a high school boot camp, right? And I did use my, my simple methods of teaching data literacy like I would to my college students because I understood that this was a, a different group of students that, that I was dealing with. So I tried to use data sets and figure out ways to make them relate to it, right? So, so one example was, you're going to a party next weekend, you are going to be a DJ, and you want to play the hottest songs that are trending, right? So that's data that's out there that's that that's available. So I provided them with data sets to help me to help them understand what are the top you know songs in America right now based on a particular genre. So I think definitely breaking it to be able to relate it to the individual that you're trying to um, you know to, to relate it to. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think on my end. Uh, I, I do work in, in data and numbers and, and all of that, but it's also, uh, first and foremost, like I, I work in entertainment and in storytelling. And I think a lot of people even still, you know, Glad has been, uh, you know, working in this advocacy space, uh, particularly focused on media for 36 years. We're kind of one of the oldest organizations specifically doing that. And there's so much uh, really just in the past kind of five to six years, uh, since, uh, especially since Oscars So White, you know, became such a, a moment that there's so many more organizations kind of working in this space and people are starting to realize more, not only the power of, um, of representation out in the world, but that you, you can't change what you can't measure if you, if you don't know that it's there, if you don't know what the full kind of picture is. And I think people are, are starting to realize that there is, a place for you know this kind of of data when it comes to entertainment, which uh, I think was a little bit uh, kind of unexpected for some people who were like, oh, this is what we you know I go home and I watch this and it, it what does it actually matter? Um, and I think for me the kind of the biggest barrier is just uh, you know working with people to make what we're telling them uh, kind of understood on a uh, on a personal level. So that can be 
uh, anything from, you know, I, I, my job sits within our GLAD Media Institute. So in addition to uh, doing, the, I'm, you know, the lead on our annual reports on film and television, but I also do a lot of uh, consulting and educating with storytellers, networks, studios, creators, all of that. And so maybe that is when I'm in a, when I'm in doing a presentation to a writer's room, uh, you know, also connecting a stat that they might not remember uh, to something that is either a similar project to what they're doing, another show that is in the same genre or other things that have come out from that company and that will help them kind of tie it back um, or putting things into a number that is a little bit more personal to them. So one thing that we talk about a lot is that, uh, you know, from our surveys that we do with the Harris Poll, we found that 20% of Americans 18 to 34 identify as somehow LGBTQ. Um, and that 20% number, people have had a little bit of trouble kind of understanding what that means. But then when you say one in five, you're like, oh, okay, I have five friends. I understand now what one in five means. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's that sort of thing or things like, uh, you know, we just put out our newest uh, where we are on TV last last month. Um, and, you know, part of what we talked about in there was this wild last year that we've had in television and the fact that, you know, it makes sense anecdotally that people are home more, people are consuming more media than they have in a, in a long time because we're all trapped in our houses. Uh, and we're also we're also using entertainment in a different way than we ever have before. It's more of a tool for connection than it's ever been. And so we, uh, you know, pulled in some some stats about that with with Nielsen ratings and uh, surveys from other um, other groups who would kind of talk to audiences about what what does entertainment mean to you right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we're able to put that in context with things that people are seeing actually happen in the industry. So at the same time as we're seeing those changes and those stats rise, you know, we also see Hulu and Disney Plus launching watch together functionalities. So that kind of thing where you can really connect the dots for people and let them know what you want them to walk away with, uh, I think is is sort of the key to um, to overcoming a little bit of, of that barrier for me. Mm -hmm. um, I really like what both of you said about the, the you use different terms for it, but the notion of forming connection, because when I'm teaching, I find that so important and teaching a field like math where uh, a larger than some other disciplines percentage of the students walk into the room feeling alienated by the subject from day one. Mm -hmm. And so when I walk into a room, my number one mission is as their educator for me to connect with them. So I become sort of like a trusted source of connection. Um, I'm not also an alien, but also then to connect them with the material more before I actually teach them the material sometimes. So meaning I'll, I'll tell stories that teach them the math, but they don't realize it's the math. And then I suddenly introduce the definitions and the, the formal um, sort of gadgetry or formulas or whatever we need to use, but I've given them some intuitional context for it. I've told them, you already know how to do this. You just don't know you already know how to do this. So don't be scared or wigged out by the formal words that I'm gonna write down in this definition. I'll explain how it relates to this thing that you already understand. Um, to the point where I taught a class once that was an upper level undergraduate course that intimidates many students. And one of the most common questions became, yo, Beachnik, can you explain that in not math? And they're <laughs> like, can you explain that with a party game or an analogy? So the other day people were asking me about something in class and I said, well, it's kind of like the difference between a soccer field and a basketball court. I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, on a soccer field, as long as you're still touching the line, you're in bounds. But on a basketball court, once you touch the line, you're out of bounds. And suddenly that gave them a context for understanding this technical mathematical term that they didn't have before. And what both of you were just sort of talking about is trying to connect the information to people wherever they are, whatever makes it meaningful for them. And I think that's actually part of what's 
challenging about data literacy overall is that there's no one tool that works for everyone in every context. Yeah. And I would also say that, you know, <clears throat> so as I mentioned uh, when I introduced myself, I have done different work regarding um, data stories for uh, the conversation about abolition. And so we know that along with a lot of the data about COVID, we we're also getting increased kind of data and conversations about um, police violence and police murders of people. And we're seeing all these kind of solutions that are being presented as kind of data-driven solutions. And so one of the things is, you know, um, I teach a lot of courses that deal with criminology. And so, you know, in all of my classes, we talk a lot about data literacy, not just the research methods. And we talk a lot about kind of crime data and, and the politics of crime data and crime data collection. But one of the things that I think for me, what I'm interested in with data literacy, both in and outside the classroom is, and that I see as a barrier is for, you know, how do you encourage people to see themselves having a political stake in increasing their data literacy, right? So it's not mm -hmm. just kind of an intellectual exercise or not just so I can kind of understand commentary, right? Which is important, right? It's an important to understand the discourse and so forth. But so for example, you know, um, we're seeing kind of these calls for defund the police. And one of the things that different organizers and cities are talking about sometimes in these webinars or they're talking about social media, they're saying they're seeing more and more people who are showing up to like city meetings about budgets. And these are residents who are saying, how are these budgets being used? And like, we have a stake in kind of knowing where the money's going and why is it going to policing and not to kind of social services and people are struggling, right? And these organizers are talking about how, you know, um, you often would not get a lot of people who are not kind of organizers at these budget meetings, but you're having an increased number of people. And I remember seeing an organizer on social media talking about how, you know, they and other organizers, they had to kind of work through learning how to read budgets, right? And this is part of the work is that we we can have these political concerns or we can have training in one area, but, you know, data sources are different and no, understanding those data sources can have different political stakes. And so for me, I'm always interested in how do we kind of encourage more and more people to see it within their political interest to have data literacy so that they can kind of participate in decision-making processes, participate in kind of things that have high political stakes for the quality of their lives, right? And that's not always just some kind of, you know, not to be weird, but like, you know, some, I don't know, some pundit on social media who pulls out some data points and people just wanted to argue with them, right? But it's like, no, people showing up and, you know, these folks saying, I want to be able to have a say in how this budget's being used. And this might mean that, we might need more people to kind of have study groups about how to actually read a budget, right? Well, I'm, so. I say, I'm one into that. You hear that kind of in the spectrum around the people engaging and leaning into working to read that data more. Mm -hmm. You've also seen groups like Data for Black Lives speak mm -hmm. up really, really vocally about the ways in which data is weaponized against their communities mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we think about these kind of issues, we have to think at both ends of those spectrums, the way data gets kind of Data, increasing data literacy gets transform is transformative for some of this political activism. But on mm -hmm. the flip side, the ways in which people have weaponized data in different ways against these communities. I know, Megan, did you have a, a comment to chime in on there? Uh, I was just gonna say on, uh, on the kind of point of helping people to see their power and that they, they have a kind of stake here. I think one thing that, you know, for LGBTQ people that we have talked a lot about and especially has kind of come back in this past year was that, you know, with the kind of HIV and, and AIDS crisis in the 80s, there was sort of a, a whole kind of generation that had to, on the fly, sort of become these these medical experts and, and go in and do that kind of advocating in a, uh, quite frankly, hostile to them space with, with talking to the CDC or talking to drug companies about different tests and, and advocating for new drugs. And, uh, I think there, you know, one thing that uh, I saw a lot of last year was a lot of uh, really, you know, prominent uh, HIV activists who are still uh, with us kind of leading conversation and in, in community spaces in this last year about how do you learn about these things? How do you talk about them? How can you kind of deal in this space when 
you know, the, the majority of, of us are not medical or health experts who, you know, are conversant and fully understand all of these data sets or really technical um, uh, language. And I, I think also, you know, one thing that we've really seen in the past uh, to wildly shift from that uh, on the entertainment side kind of shift in, in the past five to six years has been that same thing of, of fans uh, starting to realize their power in the space and how to use these kind of data concepts for advocacy. I think it really kind of it hit, it hit a new wave a few years ago when there was a show that sort of made major headlines for killing off one of their queer characters uh, in a year where uh, it was just like week after week after week after week, there was a dead queer woman on TV, usually in a very uh, kind of violent and awful way. Uh, and it had been an issue that had been talked about in LGBTQ spaces and, and with ourselves that like, isn't that just awful? And we're so frustrated and tired of shows doing this. Uh, and these fans just organized and they went and hunted down, uh, you know, writers to talk to at some of these outlets and with kind of the advent of social media and how easy it is to reach people now, uh, they just started pitching outlets and, and made it uh, a conversation that uh, was all of a sudden in every, uh, you know, major trade and that showrunners were being asked uh, about, are you gonna continue to do this? Will you pledge to not do it anymore? Uh, and out of that came, you know, a few different uh, kind of documentaries on the subject. So I think that there is kind of a, a new, especially with social media, um, emphasis on, on people realizing how much of a kind of megaphone that they they have um, that that we've never had before. I think um, another thing sort of building on that and what we're talking about right now in terms of different outlets, different places where it's really important is people having the confidence that they can learn whatever type of data is important to them to make that difference. And Chantilly, where you were talking about giving that example that your students could relate to, like once they had seen that and done that, they could then believe that they'd be capable of engaging with data in another way, in another realm of their life that was important to them. And I think that that's really empowering because an, as long as it's something that's sort of beyond you or, or um, seems uh, mystifying to you, then it might be something that you don't actively engage with. But once you get people to understand that they can do it in some context, they can do it in a context that's important to them and they can learn how to do it in another context, I think that that's really empowering to people. Because I think everyone in this room would agree, like, I'm not fluent in any of your specialties, but I have the confidence that if I sat down and had a meaningful conversation with you and studied a little bit, I could come to understand what it is you do. And part of that is because I've done it in other areas before. And I think that that, as we see sort of data, as everyone sees it proliferate and understand its impact on everything becomes increasingly important for everyone. I think another aspect of that I saw last year was that, you know, everyone had access to this COVID data that John Hopkins was putting out, right? And I saw that a lot of individuals were taking this data and visualizing it. They were trying to kind of do their part. And a part of me was like, okay, you know, this is good that you are diving into some data the first time you're trying to understand something. But then on the other side, I saw, you know, a lot of health experts with concerns about the ways that individuals were visualizing the data instead of stepping up to maybe educate, you know, the, the broader population on maybe how they should or why they shouldn't visualize the data this way. I saw a lot of shaming, right? And I think that's a, a major barrier as well when someone makes a mistake, right? Um, us as data professionals, sometimes we shame them for the mistake instead of trying to educate them on the mistake. And that's gonna shun them away from wanting to learn more about data, wanting to, to be more, more literate in, the, in this space. Are the stakes higher in a public health crisis where people are acting on information? I'm thinking Crystal Lee had a recent publication looking at uh, analyzing misinformation about COVID and how misinformation spread. And one of the ways was through various different Facebook groups and other places where a requirement was that you could only share graphs and charts that you made that were not from the mainstream media. 
So the charts and graphs were deliberately designed to mislead in different ways, especially mm -hmm. around critical issues like mask wearing. And so I would, I would be curious to the panel, in the, in the midst of a global pandemic, are the ethical stakes higher in terms of what people are kind of working on privately or with a mentor versus what they're publishing publicly on a topic that's rife with various different controversies, but also with very big impacts on personal decision making around taking specific pu public health prevention actions? Well, the stakes are higher, but I'm pretty sure that there is no government, no human, no expert who didn't make mistakes with COVID, mm -hmm. right? So that is the one uniting factor. You can say um, the stakes are higher, but that's also part of the reason why there's a peer review process when you really get to formal publications. Sure. And I think that that's one of the things that we talk, we're talking about data right now, but a lot of what's coming in is social media and everyone's access to a microphone and how, how we personally use data versus how experts use data and who has the responsibility for communicating it. There are a lot of ethical decisions and conversations to be had about all of it and like how to look at it with a critical lens and when we're teaching versus berating and who's my standards for one of my students trying to use COVID data are very different than my standards for Dr. Fauci trying to use COVID data, right? Like if my student makes a mistake, I feel differently about it than if our president makes a mistake in interpretation. So the size of the audience and the microphone that they have in terms of who they're publishing to and who they're being amplified by. But also, I mean, this is something that I, in my research methods course, I actually teach advanced research methods very differently than how I was taught and also how a lot of my colleagues teach it. And, and part of it is because I tell my class, we're gonna think a lot about the political economy of research methods. So we're thinking a lot about money. We're thinking a lot about funding. We're thinking a lot about even, you know, I, ha I used to have them do a content analysis of newspaper articles, but I had to do a whole training on distinguishing between, you know, the New York Times a, like a think piece in the New York Times versus something that might have been actually, you know, fact checked, right? And not to say fact checked still can't have problems, but it's very different than somebody who's just being paid to write a think piece, right? And so one of the things is we think about all these issues around money, and the reality is you also have data entrepreneurs, right? Part of data visualization, data entrepreneurs, and people creating their own data sets. Some of the some of it has to do with trying to create data that is not available, right? So there is no database of police murders. So this is why you have these, you know, um, organizations or newspapers that are creating databases out of it, right? And one of the things that's really interesting to see in the academic journals is these databases are now being treated as legitimate databases. And so you have, and they're citing them and talking about the differences between the databases and so forth. So one of the things I often want my students to think about is issues of money and funding, who's sponsoring the data, right? But also you have data entrepreneurship. And one thing you saw after COVID, um, and you saw this also with you know police violence, is people kind of creating a brand or creating kind of you know a data set or saying, we are going to start tracking this. And this is not to say that they might not have valid political concerns or integrity. I'm not trying to question that, right? But there's a data marketplace, right? And we can think about both kind of the data marketplace of, you know, one is you have you have a lot of data that is not publicly available, whether it's not either being collected by the state or it's not being disseminated by the state, right? Or it's, you know, certain data sets that have just kind of disappeared or they've kind of languished, right? So you have that, but then you have policy groups that, you know, kind of want to be the experts on data, right? You have kind of, you know, data artists, all this stuff. And I think that's an important part of this conversation is that part of the data literacy is to understand there's a data marketplace and mm -hmm. that can still, and that can be very much marketed still as social justice and so forth. And that's the stuff I also encourage my students to think about. And you're still talking about data for the sake of data. You're not talking about the data marketplace where they're selling my views on Facebook to change what ads I get shown, right? Like that's a whole nother data marketplace that I think is somewhat important for people to have some understanding of it, mm -hmm. its existence. And this is for people, for everyone, not just your students, yes. because what we see influences us. 
Mm-hmm. But what we do influences what we see, right? Like we are constantly creating an abundance of data for companies to use and market in different ways. And that's going to impact everything that we're exposed to. No, I understand that, Lindsay. But what I'm saying with the data. Oh, I think yours is much yeah. more interesting. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, we're not yeah. even getting into the like direct. Yeah. No, no. And this. I understand. But what I'm saying is, is that some of the people who are data entrepreneurs are not necessarily specialists in oh, the kind of research yeah. area that's being done. And, 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 and also one of the things I talk to my students about is you can have people who are specialists and they have ideological differences, right? So you can have people with PhDs and historians and stuff. Where, so I don't necessarily just assume because you have a PhD that you have integrity or that you have the same political interest in the use of data, right? But this is part of it is that you have people who are sometimes kind of creating data sets or brands around data sets. And part of the work of understanding that marketplace is saying, what is your you know, what is your interest politically with this data? What, where are you collecting this data from? And what is your business interest, frankly, right? Mm -hmm. And what is your training beyond the data itself, right? So a lot of people have data training and very specialized data training, but they aren't specialists in some of these areas like public health, right? Mm -hmm. And I do think the stakes are really high that you should have people who are specialists in public health and have good politics being at the forefront of these conversations. And I would rather have them learn how to translate their work to the data than having data artists just kind of, you know, making data available, but having very limited understanding of the public health. And maybe they have good politics, but if you have a very poor understanding of the public health, I think that's dangerous, right? Hmm. I also think, um, as you say that, I'm thinking about this historically, and I'm thinking about how much easier it is to become your own like data miner now Mm -hmm. data miner now Mm -hmm. than it would have been previously because um what what came to my head was like ida b wells Mm -hmm. right like the fact that she collected information on lynchings was so profound in and of itself because the data didn't exist and just having you know like having information collected in a different way was so important. But now, like so many other things in life, um, it's more accessible for someone to decide that they want to do that. So having people do it who know what they're doing with it or working with people who know what they're doing with it. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, some people can be trained in the data, but not really in the public health. And so I am perfectly happy to get a pe- public health specialist and a data specialist together and have them work together and have them work together on the project. Like you're an expert in this, I'm an expert in that. Let's get together and see what it means together. Um, well, and I think and I think all of these themes are, are so interesting, and I think we could probably talk about this for hours, if not days, in terms of all these nuances and the, the Pandora's box that are being opened around data privacy and who's selling our data and using our data in different ways and the ethics of those questions. Um, circling back full circle though, as we're closing in on an, our hour, if we were to leave our viewers today with just one kind of either a piece of advice for people who are interested in building their own data literacy or numeracy, or a piece of advice for those who are looking to instill and teach these concepts to others, since I know all of you have played different roles as teachers and mentors in different ways, um, what's that one piece of advice that you would leave our viewers with today? I would say connection. So Lindsay said it right, right? connecting with your audience, connecting with who you're trying to uh, relate, you know, data visualization or data to in general, you have to connect, right? When I was in school, um, any topic that I was taught, the, the, my understanding of the topic was, was greater. Once I connected with the professor and the professor connected what I was learning to something that I could relate it to, right? So it's the connection piece and understanding that that data is a, is a tough topic sometimes when you dive into the weeds of it but you really have to, to follow that to your audience. I would say that, you know, um, I would encourage people to think of all data as political and that part of data literacy is for us to think critically about the politics and the political economy of data collection, data dissemination, and also the uses of data, both from kind of above, but also from oppressed communities, right? That mm-hmm. part of it is for us to kind of have to say, what are the uses of data? 
how do we want this data to not be weaponized against us? What is our political stake in better understanding this stuff? Yeah, I think that um, sort of tying together what both of you are saying, um, people like to collect data a lot, um, which is not dissimilar from the way that my students like to do calculations. But um, I would say thinking about what things mean mm -hmm. and whether that be connecting to them or thinking about what the motives were behind how and what it was collect con collected, um, context really matters. And so like when I'm teaching a math class, I don't let my students use calculators. And when I'm teaching calculus, I make them look at a lot of pictures interpreting rates of change because mm. calculating a derivative might be a really valuable skill for someone going on in, in calculus. But if you're not going out and on going on in calculus, interpreting a rate of change is still really important. When people started talking about bending the curve, Back in March and April, I was like, it's a second derivative in real life. You get this. <laughs> Suddenly people care. And, um, and there's this notion of sort of interpretation of data being really important and being something that uh, we can think critically about both in terms of how we use data ourselves and how we uh, look at the data of other people. Yeah, I think uh, mine would be uh, very kind of similar to uh, Chantilly in that I think the thing that I would want people to remember is uh, a little bit twofold. Any data that you encounter, kind of go into it uh, without uh, a pre-context in your mind of, of just wanting something to confirm what you think. Um, go into it and, and see it for what it is, whether that's agreeing with you or disagreeing with you. Uh, but also as the person who is um, uh, maybe collecting the data or or translating that data out to people, um, always, I think, come back to uh, what is personal and, uh, you know, connecting that, uh, that story for them in a way that they will, um, you know, understand and, and be able to walk away and you know, tell their their friends or their family that night or their coworker this thing that they learned uh, about you know whatever it is that that you're trying to get across to them. Thank you. And I love that this whole conversation about data and numbers and math has really arced over really strongly into politics and empathy and storytelling and all these different disciplines and domains and the fact that we have uh, leaders here who are from very different backgrounds and very different areas of expertise, I think really shows just how cross-cutting these conversations can be and how interesting they can be when we're all having this conversation around what these key ways are that we can help to make data uh, more accessible, more available, more understood and thought about more critically than it might be today in our kind of deluge of charts and graphs and dashboards and information. So uh, Megan, Chantilly, Tam Tamara, Lindsay, it's been great getting to have this conversation with all of you today. I hope everyone's leaving feeling a little bit inspired to be a little bit more critical the next time you're reading a chart or a graph or looking at data or information or maybe get interested in one of those budget meetings. And we hope that you'll continue these conversations with your own friends and colleagues because this is a conversation that's worth having, I think, across disciplines and across domains of expertise. With that, we'll go ahead and we'll close out our panel for today. Thank you all so very much for your time and we wish everyone a wonderful rest of the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doran Weber. I'm a vice president and program director at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And it's my pleasure to announce the winner of this year's uh, Sloan Development Grant at the Athena Film Festival. Our winner is Shireen Dabis for her script, What the Eyes Don't See. It's a true life story based on the Iraqi American pediatrician who blew the whistle on state and local government officials who exposed tens of thousands of residents in Flint, Michigan to toxic levels of lead. This script will now get a $20,000 grant to develop uh, and it will be part of a uh, virtual reading in the spring. So congratulations again to Shireen Dabis. <laughs>